Welcome to this GSA Momentum Discussion podcast episode titled Meeting the Needs of Diverse Caregivers. Momentum discussions highlight topics experiencing great momentum in the field of gerontology. We're grateful to Genentech, Lily, Azai, and Otska for their support of the GSA Care Toolkit for Primary Care Teams and today's podcast. My name is Jen Pettis and I'm the Director of Strategic Alliances at the Gerontological Society of America, or GSA, and I'm pleased to serve as a host for today's Momentum Discussion podcast episode. I'm so pleased to be joined by my friends today from the Alzheimer's Association of Northeastern New York. Beth smith Boven is the chapter's executive director, and Debbie Abreo is the community outreach manager for DEI initiatives. Welcome, Beth and Debbie. I'm so glad you could join me. Thank you, John. We're delighted to be here, and thank you for all you do for our chapter here at the Alzheimer's Association. My pleasure. Well, according to the Alzheimer's Association, over 11 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's or other dementias, such as family members, friends, or other unpaid caregivers. And these folks are the focus of this podcast episode. Beth, who are the caregivers? In other words, can you set the stage for the rest of our time together by telling us some information about caregivers in the United States? Sure. So typically we divide caregivers into two categories, if you will. And for the purposes of our discussions today, Jen, we'll be talking about those informal caregivers. Those are generally family members or friends providing that unpaid care and support. And interestingly enough, the unpaid care and support was estimated to be over 18 billion hours at a numeric value of $339 billion in 2022. So imagine if we didn't have these wonderful unpaid caregivers providing this service to all of us, this would be a monumental expense and burden for the healthcare system. And probably not surprisingly to many people listening today, about two thirds of dementia caregivers are women. In addition to that, we estimate that one third of those women are adult dogs daughters and a quarter of them are sandwiched in between taking care of children of their own as well as their parents. The remaining caregivers are typically spouses, and in that circumstance, they are often elderly themselves with their own health conditions to to manage as well. Beth, in follow-up, it's important to consider that caregivers, just like individuals with Alzheimer's and dementia, come from all races and ethnicities. What does the data tell us about the prevalence of Alzheimer's and dementia, as well as about caregivers in certain racial and ethnic groups? Yeah. So we know that Alzheimer's disease disproportionately impacts the black and brown communities as well as the Hispanic community. So folks in the black and brown community are twice as likely as whites to develop Alzheimer's disease and in the Hispanic community, 1.5 times more likely to develop this disease. We also know that Alzheimer's disease is more prevalent in women than in men. And while we wish we had more data on caregiving in diverse communities, we do know a couple of things. We know, for example, that Black, Hispanic, and Asian American caregivers indicate that there are greater demands on them. They are more at risk for developing depression, and there are fewer resources available to them. In addition, we know that they are more reluctant than their counterparts to accept that help that is available through various agencies. And as such, they are more likely to develop physical, emotional, and financial burdens as a result of their caregiving experience. So next, I'd like to hear from you both about a few examples of how the Alzheimer's Association in general, as well as how your team locally is supporting caregivers of certain racial or ethnic communities. Debbie, let's start with you. If you could share some work at the local level and how healthcare professionals and others might apply what you're learning in their own work. Absolutely. So from the community level, we target underserved communities by building a presence in the community. We work with grassroots organizations to bring awareness to the diverse populations. All communities are unaware of the impact of Alzheimer's and other dementias and are also unfamiliar with the warning signs. So we find that professionals tend to focus or have an expertise in their own field, yet they're lacking the knowledge of the impact of the disease. Professionals are our community members as well, and it's something I would like to highlight 
play. And I try to bring in a prevention approach to the communities and caregivers on how to take care of your brains in addition to disease education. And Beth, can you add a couple of examples of work at the national level and like Debbie share some learnings that others might apply while they're supporting caregivers? Absolutely. So I'm very proud of the Alzheimer's Association and their leadership in the area of DE&I. In 2019, when we revised our last national strategic plan, we added for the first time a goal that specifically said no longer can it simply be a value of this organization that we respect diverse communities and we are an inclusive organization. We must do the work to ensure that these folks in these communities have access to the resources they need. And so we, at that time, began to have an outreach manager. We're so fortunate to have Debbie, who is bilingual here in Northeastern New York, as our person who is, as she said, out there providing that grassroots support. But that's only one step that the organization took with this new strategic plan. Jen, as you well know, we have a 24-hour helpline, and that is manned by either master's prepared or PhD prepared clinicians, dementia experts, to provide care and support 365 days a year around the clock. And believe it or not, we are able to translate that service into as many as 200 different languages. And in addition to that, 30 members of our helpline staff at the Home Office Call Center are now bilingual members of our team, which really is extraordinary. We also provide an education program to dementia providers in communities. It's called Project ECHO. It's an educational outreach program available to primary care docs and mid-level providers who are trying to do their best to learn more about making this diagnosis. And interestingly enough, 40% of the Project ECHO programs that we've delivered in the past year have been in either rural communities or federally funded healthcare uh, centers, which is wonderful news. It means that this education is getting to providers who are seeing these diverse audiences. And then lastly, Debbie spoke about the warning signs and how few people know about those warning signs. And we just launched a new campaign in multiple languages to teach Americans about the warning signs of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And Beth, what's the website where folks can find information? ALZ.org, a simple one. And not only can folks find information, but professionals can find a tab of information specific to their work as well. I think it's also important, and you've alluded to this a little bit, that there's diversity in so many areas that we need to consider when we think of caregivers. We need to think of things like ages, incomes, education levels, sexualities, gender identities. Beth, what are unique strengths and needs of caregivers from the LGBTQIA community? And what advice do you have for healthcare professionals and others to support these caregivers? Yeah. Think about strengths and needs of of caregivers from that community. Sure. So um, in terms of needs for that community, it's, you know, we see some similarities between that community and our other priority diverse communities. And that is that they They complained of finding discrimination when they reach out for care and support services, frankly, not unlike discrimination that perhaps they find without a dementia diagnosis attached. And and that's really something we're trying to mitigate through education. So at a national level, we are partnered with SAGE and they provide education on issues to staff around the nation. But then locally, our chapter has partnered with folks from the Pride Center, and we had an amazing two-hour educational program from the director of the Pride Center to increase sensitivity and awareness about the issues faced in this population. In terms of strength, I think partnerships with the Alzheimer's Association is a strength because they know that they can find a trusted resource among our team here as as well as trusted information and the loyalty that the community has for each other. So there's an enormous amount of support within the LGBTQ community. Um, and so that we often find that care partners come from within their own community. And where one lives is really 
an important issue as well. For example, here in upstate New York, you had shared with me that some of your priority areas for the chapter include rural communities, Native American reservations, and Amish communities. And Debbie, if you could reflect on those communities a bit, what are some unique strengths and challenges for caregivers in these three groups that I mentioned? And how are you and your colleagues working to support caregivers in those communities? So these communities mentioned face barriers to access due to location, cultural or religious beliefs. We identify the need and find a supportive way to support and serve these communities. We have hired a new rural outreach manager to address these rural communities and identify those barriers. In the North Country, we have identified an indigenous population and also have a designated North Country program manager to work with this community. So we do identify that, you know, with lack of internet, access, transportation also affects services, including care. We find that caregivers, like many, are unfamiliar with the disease. So when it lands on the ones that they care for, which is why the Alzheimer's Association's free services are so vital to support and educate caregivers and families with the tools throughout this journey. We want to make sure you don't feel alone and an inclusive approach to assist everyone. And, and I think if I can just add to that, one of the things that Debbie understands and does best is she goes out into these communities. She is rarely here in the office. She is out meeting with families where they live and where they work. And that's the critical part of this. We can't serve these populations sitting in an office. We have to be meeting with them in their local faith community centers, in their community centers, the places that they're most comfortable. And Debbie's learned so much about how to make those inroads, bringing uh, culturally appropriate food with her everywhere she goes to, to attract an audience and make sure that she's connected to the people that she is trying to connect with. And it's worked. Our numbers have exploded in terms of serving these populations. I will also add, Jen, though, that a big barrier to the work that we try to do is technology deserts that are here in New York State throughout our 17-county footprint and beyond. But we have several of our North Country counties that simply can't get our programs by internet. And we have several of them in the southwest part of our territory as well. So we look forward to our politicians, frankly, addressing this challenge for all of us in New York State, particularly if we ever face another pandemic like we did during 2020 and 2021, where really being virtual with people was the only way we could deliver the service. Well, this has been a great discussion and I appreciate your time and insights and of course, all that you do for people in our area and their care partners. Uh, A few key points that I heard, one was about trust. I heard kind of that theme of trust along, whether it's trusted resources, trusted information and trusted people, the idea of coming to a community, but not just coming to the community, but staying in the community and engaging with people to build that trust and how important that is to really to be able to serve people that need assistance. I also heard the issue of technology, certainly loud and clear that technology is great when it works, right? And when it's available, but in rural communities and other locations, it's just not available to some of our neighbors here right in New York State. I also heard about warning signs, and it's wonderful to hear that your warning signs resources are going to be coming out in multiple languages, but really elevating how important it is to elevate the idea of brain health overall, not just focusing on early detection, but talking about as we age, so brain health across the lifespan in diverse and underserved communities is such an important message as well. What are some things that I didn't mention that you really would like to leave our listeners with? Beth, I'll start with you. Well, let's see. First of all, I think as the executive director here at the Alzheimer's Association, I want to make sure that your listeners understand that we are here for all of those informal caregivers and to meet their needs. But we're also here for professional caregivers. So if there are folks out there that want to learn more about the warning signs or want to learn more about how we can help the people that they are helping, we are happy to do that. We're happy to connect them to Project Echo or do private education for any of those folks as well. We are the resource. We are here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we have a robust website full of information for anybody that needs it. 
Debbie, how about you? Some final thoughts. Sure. I just wanted to um, reiterate that in the BIPOC communities, they're more affected by this disease, but they're less than likely to receive a diagnosis, which is kind of vital to throw out there. Another thing is kind of busting some of the myths, right? A lot of people think that this disease is affecting only folks over 65, and we want to let everyone know that you can be diagnosed as early as your 40s. So brain health is so vital because it's affecting folks even younger than 65. Beth, any last words from you? No, I think ending with brain health is terrific because there are all things that we can do. Get a good night's sleep, follow all those heart healthy habits, stay active and engaged on both a cognitive, social and spiritual level. And you may indeed reduce your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease or other forms of dementia. And that's in all communities and a great way to end, I think. Terrific. I agree. That is a great way to end. Thank you for joining me and for all that you and your colleagues are doing at the association to reach and to support diverse caregivers. And thanks to everyone who's listening to this episode of the GSA Momentum Discussion Podcast. We hope you found it informative and enjoyable. Thank you, Jen. Thanks so much, Jen. To learn more about the Gerontological Society of America, visit geron.org. The Gerontological Society of America was founded in 1945 to promote the scientific study of aging, cultivate excellence in interdisciplinary aging research, and education to advance innovations in practice and policy. For more information about GSA, visit geron.org.